it comes to Tate, it's preaching this message of hyper-responsibility and making yourself better as a man in order to provide for the people around you. The fact that there's a very large possibility that uh, the guy participated in human trafficking, you know, what's in that Romanian indictment is uh, astounding. You mentioned earlier about the red pill space. The longer that you stay inside of it, the less useful it becomes. I think the Matrix is more of an internal thing than it is uh, some sort of oppressive world government. Why do you think Christianity has become a joke? Christianity has started to embrace the very ideals that it has fought vehemently against. These liberal policies have sort of brought along a bit of a side effect of boundarylessness. Can America stop the war? If it stopped funding Ukraine, absolutely. Do you think a central bank digital currency is coming? Yes, it's coming and I'm very afraid. <laughs> Within the next 10 years, the world as we know it is gonna be a completely different thing. This is one of the most explosive conversations I have ever had. Come down the rabbit hole. If you'd like to show your support, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn the notification bell on. Who is the anti-profit? The anti-profit is sort of an amalgamation of, of several things. I think when I first came into content creation. I wanted to be able to kind of post things online that, um, you know, I, I think I was keeping in the back of my subconscious to a certain degree. But I think as, as time went on, it became sort of a necessity for me to post anonymously because of the particular employer that I was working for at the time. I was uh, working for a very large content creator, and I knew that this type of brand would be something that wouldn't really uh, work for him because I was managing his team and it would be probably what he would consider to be a, a negative uh, uh, representation of his brand. So I eventually ended up going in the direction of uh, picking a mask. And I didn't really realize it at the time, but I, as, as time went on, I realized that the fact that I had picked a white mask was pretty intentional, at least at, on a subconscious level, because I think ultimately what it is that I'm trying to do with this channel is not necessarily convince anyone of anything in terms of like the opinions that I'm espousing as anti-profit. I'm, I'm basically just coming up, uh, talking into a camera and uh, basically presenting ideas that you can either agree with or disagree with. But even in the case of disagreeing with me, you're sort of forced to articulate your disagreement to me at the very least internally in your own mind. And as a result of that, you're able to walk away from my content having a deeper understanding of what it is that you think about certain you know, current events uh, or issues of our time. And as a result of that, you're able to engage the people in your life uh, with more of a level-headed approach rather than being caught up in your emotion because you haven't really thought about your position on any of these issues. Um, and as a result, you know, it, it potentially turns into a screaming match. So I, I think, you know, the, the white blankness of the mask is what I hope uh, can be sort of a mirror for people to kind of project themselves onto who I am as a content creator rather than, you know, have anti-profit necessarily be a person. It's, it's more of a symbol. And that, that sounds kind of culty there at the end. But uh, I think in general, um, I'm, I'm hoping to sort of act as a sounding board for people uh, with, with everything that's kind of going on in the world. So um, you're now a content creator working for yourself as opposed to working for a content creator, is that right? That's correct, yep. Okay, so who was the content creator you were working for? Oh, uh, that unfortunately needs to remain anonymous because- Can uh, I have three that, guesses? Uh, sure, go for it. Gary V. No, I, I wish that would, be a, that would be a great collaboration. Andrew Tate. Nope, still no. Rob Moore. <laughs> okay, thank God. I was, I was so happy that you didn't actually pick the person. I was like, ah, oh, shit, if he actually picks yeah. it, I'm not gonna lie about it. So yeah, unfortunately, none of those three. It was in a completely different space than what it is that I do now. Um, it was uh, in more of like the entertainment niche kind of thing, just, you know, family friendly, uh, that sort of thing. So it, oh, it, it really was a, a bit Mr. of a Beast. from- Mr. Uh, Mr. Beast. No, still no, still no, unfortunately. Yeah, the, I, I would have given it to you if, if, if that would have been correct, but unfortunately not. Okay. Um, but yeah, so a bit, bit of a jump from, from genres, but uh, I'm, I'm much more at home in this genre, I think, as a, as a content creator and just working in social media um, in general. Mm. So I love metal and um, mm. maybe the band in metal that are closest to what you do in your genre is Slipknot because, of course, they mm. all wear masks. And um, their masks gave them an act 
much more than just playing music. And sure. do you think, therefore, that your mask as your act has helped you? Because um, you've exploded, really. You know, you've gone very viral in a short period of time. Old school people like me, 44 years old, have been doing this for a decade. It takes 10 years to be an overnight success. <laughs> and you've, in terms of content, you've done it much quicker. Um, is it your message that you think people are resonating with? Or is it because you have this uh, identity that's hidden that maybe people want to, they're, they're inquisitive to know who's behind the mask? I think it's probably a combination of, uh, of the two. Originally, uh, I didn't think that the mask would actually perform all that well on social media because especially with the things that I'm talking about, I started out essentially as like, uh, you know, talking about motivational shit. Um, and as I was a little bit worried at the beginning because I was like, okay, well, I'm like talking about all of these things, but like, they're not going to be able to see my facial expression. So like, are they even going to be able to connect with me or whatever? But when I sort of A-B tested the, the content with a mask and without a mask, um, the, the mask far like outperformed anything that I was doing uh, without a mask. So I, that, that could either mean one of two things. Either I'm extremely ugly in person, which I, I fucking hope not. Uh, or the the second one is that, you know, this this does kind of work as a bit of a visual hook for people because there are a lot of motivational speakers or whatever on Instagram that are talking straight into a camera, even if their production level is really high. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of people who do that. Whereas when you come across my my channel for the first time, the first thing you probably think to yourself is what the fuck is that? So I think, uh, you know, this the, the mask does kind of grab people's attention. But on top of that, I think just based on the comments that I get, uh, people resonate with what it is that I'm saying as well. And, and I'm, I'm extremely flattered for that because ultimately, like, especially in the first eight months of this, uh, just because I'm in my ninth month at this point uh, for, for anti-profit, but in the first eight months, this, this content has really just been me sort of going around and digging around in my own subconscious and, uh, you know, just sharing what, what it is that I come up with on a weekly basis. So um, I, I think it is a little bit of column A, column B, uh, but especially for the fact that people are resonating with the message, uh, it's it's extraordinarily flattering. And if you could sum up maybe in a sentence or most in a paragraph, what is the concept of anti-profit? Sure. I think the concept behind anti-profit is really just to exist to challenge your most deeply held beliefs. Uh, if, if only for a moment, I think there's a lot of polarization in our culture at, uh, at the moment. And I try and do my best to kind of almost play devil's advocate for, for both sides to a certain degree. For example, I'm, I'm really critical of like the red pill space, for example. And I'm also really uh, critical of, uh, the, uh, you know, postmodern liberalist, uh, side of things in terms of politics is concerned. And I think the reason why I do that is because the, the, the young guy that I'm trying to speak to is someone who's kind of being pulled in both directions. And I want that guy to essentially be able to see that you don't have to really go down any of these super polarizing roads. And the best way to do that is to understand the other side of an argument um, and to not, you know, kind of get caught up in like the cult of Andrew Tate or the cult of you know, any of these other creators or whatever. Um, and and I, I think essentially what I'm trying to do is just get rid of polarization in my own small way on the internet um, by sort of going after people's deeply held beliefs, but in, in a kind way and in an empathetic way, in a way that uh, gives them a space to consider something rather than uh, feel attacked. Do you not observe a small dose of irony in you talking about, say, for example, the cult of Andrew Tate, when you're a commentator who's commented on Andrew Tate? Uh, go a little bit deeper into what you mean by that. Um, well, your content, branded as anti-profit, could be deemed as challenging our beliefs and through your content, you will refer to other people and their content, mm -hmm. Russell Brand, Andrew Tate, etc. Um, and you'll observe that there is the cult of Andrew Tate, but sure. your content is commenting on the cult of Andrew Tate. 
Sure. Yeah. So I, I think I understand the question. So I think, yeah, ultimately, if if I'm if if, if I'm critiquing critiquing the cult in the first place, is it all that useful for me to go and sort of participate in the growth of that cult by commenting on it? Is that sort of what you're getting at here? I, I think you should answer it how you perceive. Okay, cool. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, if, if we're if, if, if I'm understanding the question correctly, uh, there there is definitely a possibility of that. Um, I think in the event that uh, something that I potentially perceive to be negative in the world, um, and I comment on it, and you know, I essentially like build a brand around essentially taking that person's message and making it bigger, even if I'm critiquing it, um, there there is a bit of irony in it, though. I think the thing that I've noticed is, you know, you, you kind of mentioned the Andrew Tate one is it seems to be the case that whenever I post about Tate, uh, there is a, like, there's always a huge demographic, either of my audience or of, you know, just people that the algorithm is picking up or whatever that hop on and just will, they'll, they'll defend this guy to the very, very end. And, um, it, I mean, irregardless of anything that's inside of this indictment, I mean, there's the, the, the amount of misrepresentation around, uh, you know, what's in that Romanian indictment is, uh, astounding. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think if, again, if I'm understanding the question correctly, and I apologize if I'm not, um, I, I think, you know, there, there is a bit of irony in it for sure, but hopefully, uh, the pushback that I'm actually bringing forth on the topic is useful for the guys who are sort of inside of, let's say the cult of Andrew Tate, um, because it, it, it's presenting, you know, kind of factual, uh, critiques of, of the guy and what it is that he says. Um, and it, it, mind you, one, one last thing that I'll say is at the end of the day, when it comes to Tate, um, I can get to the end of a interview with Tate, whether it's with Candace Owens or Tucker Carlson or anything like that, and get to the end and be like, damn, like 90% of that was dope. Like there's, there's a real message there that really resonates with people and it. And it's for a reason. It's because, uh, you know, it's, it's preaching this message of hyper responsibility. Um, and, you know, taking uh, control of the things in your life that you can and making yourself better as a man in order to provide for the people around you. There's, there's nothing wrong with that message. And I think that's a message that's incredibly important, especially in, in 2023. But I do think that that, as well as the fact that there's a very large possibility that uh, the guy participated in human trafficking um, are, can, can both be uh, part of like the same character. Um, so I, I, I know I sort of went on a bit of a tangent there at the end, uh, and, and maybe that seems like I'm turning into a bit of an apologist for my, uh, for my standpoint, but I, I think that probably gives a pretty good encapsulation about the, the Andrew Tate thing. And again, I, I hope I answered the question correctly. Um, in my opinion, how you answer the question is correct. Cause I'm asking you. <laughs> cool. All right. Excellent. <laughs> so on this cult of Andrew Tate, as you call it, mm. why do you think the movement of Andrew Tate has been so pervasive? Why do people get so emotionally charged about what you call the cult of Andrew Tate? You know, I, I would be kind of guessing on this, but I, I think to a certain degree is, is that, you know, people, especially young men, um, are really starving for what they perceive to be strong, uh, masculine figures in their lives. Um, you know, just even from my own perspective, I mean, uh, I love my dad to death, God rest his soul. But I mean, there were, there were certainly elements of his parenting style and who he was as a man and how he behaved inside my family that left a lot to be desired. Um, and I think a lot of guys, especially, uh, go throughout life with that kind of gap in their heart to a certain degree. And as a result, they come across this guy who isn't, you know, coming along uh, with like the Me Too movement saying like, oh, like men should like know their place. They should never like do this. They should never do that. And instead, this guy is coming along and being like, no, fuck that. Like own who you are, uh, you know, get your fucking bag and uh, make something of yourself in the world. And if you can do that, here are all of these great things that come uh, come along with this type of lifestyle. You know, the money, the girls, the, the life, the, the, uh, the traveling, that kind of thing. Um, and I think to, to anyone that looks as like a really, really positive thing, and it's something that you want to put your energy towards, I think the, the place where I may be a little bit more critical of the idea of guys going in that direction, maybe on a more meta level is I, I, I think that there are potentially 
things in life that are a little bit more meaningful than uh, the hose and, and, and the bag uh, that you can put your time and energy into pursuing that will allow you to get to age 80, age 90 and look back on your life and be like, yeah, you know, I, I lived this the way that I really wanted to live it and I, I treated people right. So we're going to come back to Tate, hose and bag later. All right. <laughs> um, Excellent. Because... Look, a lot of people in the world right now are making a lot of interviews about Andrew Tate, and it's, I think it's an amazing life documentary to observe. But I want to talk to you because we're here. So we'll come back to that later. You said um, all this motivational shit. You know, so when you started doing your content. Now, I know Americans, the word can mean the or <laughs> things. Or it can mean a lot. In England, it means really not very good. <laughs> so uh -huh. do you have a distaste for motivational Not really. I, I think when I say motivational shit in, in regards to my own content, it's, it's more along the lines of just like, you know, when I look at my content and my process of just creating content at, at this point as opposed to eight months ago, you know, as, as any new content creator will say to themselves, it's just like, oh, like the stuff at the beginning was like shit. And it doesn't mean that, you know, the kind of content that I was creating was stuff that I didn't believe in or anything like that. It's just, I, I think I'm a little bit more comfortable in front of the camera. I'm a little bit more comfortable uh, sharing my ideas sort of on the fly. Um, and I, I think maybe me using the word shit subconsciously is me just like shitting on my own uh, abilities as a content creator at the beginning. But I, I think another side to uh, answer uh, another way to answer that question would be there's a lot of motivational stuff online that I think is uh, somewhat damaging to guys um, and that's ultimately just because at the end of the day if you have a smartphone you can talk into a camera and if you have the right hashtags and have a compelling enough of a message and someone is hurting enough, in their own personal life and they come across your content and it happens to resonate with what it is that they already believe, you're going to get views whether or not you believe it or not. And again, there's even some irony in that because you could apply that same analysis to, to me as a content creator. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, motivational stuff is, is always going to have its place in society. It's always going to have its place inside of social media because people are always hurting and people are always needing a way to get out of it. But to, to get back to the shit, a statement. I think that's more of a, a a a critique of my own content at the at the beginning of my my journey than than it was of the genre as a whole. As I sit here pondering um, what you do and the value you bring to the world and the brand that you bring, I wonder why you don't alter your voice if you've covered your face because. Surely people can still find out who you are if you haven't altered your voice. Yeah. I mean, for the people that know me, I've, I've definitely had a couple of people send me a video and be like, hey, like between the voice and the fact that like your shirt is not entirely buttoned up, I feel like this <laughs> is you. Um, so so that's, that's definitely true. Um, and, you know, I, I think the reason I don't alter my voice is just because like at the end of the day, like someone's voice gives you enough of plausible deniability. And I, I think another benefit to having this mask in the first place, let's say, is that there were things that I wanted to talk about from my past uh, with, with people who kind of fucked me over to a certain degree. But I, I had no you know, motivation to really drag their names through the mud um, just because you know, they have jobs, they have real lives. And you know, at this point, we've gone our separate ways and I wish them the best. And I, while I want to be able to talk about these things because I feel like it would be useful for people, um, I uh, don't want to solely anyone's career as a result. So, uh, but again, I think the face does enough of keeping me anonymous in that realm of things, um, as opposed to, you know, my voice, which, you know, if you happen to recognize me, then you know, fine, well done. But, uh, but it, it keeps those people protected as much as I need it to at the end of the day. So you mentioned earlier about the red pill space. And I think you said that you were, you know, quite critical of that. So two things. Can you explain to people who don't understand the red pill, blue pill matrix analogy, what the red pill space is and why you're quite critical of the red pill space? Yeah, sure. So here's the thing. When it comes to the red pill space, I, I, while I am critical of it, I do think that it has its place in uh, guys' development. A few years ago when I got divorced, I was kind of searching around for 
content that would allow me to sort of interact with women. And really, in, as far as in my life, it really was kind of for the first time because uh, that relationship lasted four and a half years. Before that, I was in another relationship that lasted five years. And these were women that generally started up conversations with me. And here I found myself in the dating market. And, you know, I, I had also been in a relationship where the, the person took a lot more than they gave to the relationship. And that's, that's a vast understatement, but just for the sake of keeping the conversation going, uh, they, they took much more than they gave. And I think I was looking for a lot of answers as to why like women might do this type of thing and whether or not other guys had run into that sort of thing as well. And as a result, finding the red pill space was very useful at the beginning of my trajectory sort of out of despair and rebuilding myself. My, my main critique with the red pill space from there is all, very similar to any sort of ideology that you happen to pick up. The longer that you stay inside of it, the less useful it becomes. And as far as the red pill space is concerned, like ideas that it espouses um, are basically that, uh, you know, men need to uh, 100% of the time lead a relationship. They need to basically have certain expectations of women um, in terms of like body count. They need to uh, basically train their women to behave the way that they want them to, uh, behave, um, is like, again, there, there are even elements of all the things that I just said that, um, you could take to a relationship. And I believe actually have like a pretty healthy dynamic between people, but with the creators that, uh, sort of, uh, maintain a presence inside of these, in, inside of this space, they sort of become a bit of a one trick pony because there are only so many things to say on that level uh, without then leaving the red pill space. And I think a lot of these creators have built a brand around this type of thing. And so they harp on, you know, uh, women in a pretty negative way. And they build brands around bringing like in really stupid individuals and basically making them look ridiculous. Um, where as I think, you know, most women that I interact with aren't these three or four hoes that, you know, have slept with like a hundred guys have like absurd expectations when it comes to only fans or any of these different things. Like most women are just kind of regular people that are like going about their lives. And I think if you take the red pill lens and view all women that way, you're, you're just going to kind of throw yourself into a hall of mirrors that you can't get out of. And I think that's where a lot of guys have sort of ended up. Um, so to briefly answer your original question, I'm so sorry. Red pill space uh, is kind of what I just said. Blue pill space, I would say, is a very much along the lines of like, you know, uh, it's totally okay for like a woman to be like the main breadwinner in a household. Feminism is a good thing. Um, birth control has no negative side effects uh, in, in terms of, um, you know, overall health and like who they actually end up like mating with, like that kind of thing. So I, I, I think that gives a bit of a brief overview, but uh, hopefully one that uh, paints enough of a picture for the viewer here. Actually, I kind of want to go down this road because I'm more known for business entrepreneurship money. I've been doing this nearly 20 years. I used to have this rule that wouldn't talk about politics or religion or dating and relationship advice to know my lane. But as the world's got more, um, may, may we say, um, mm. And more and more people who haven't got a f clue about relationships are giving relationship advice. I feel like if I don't speak out, then um, there's going to be even more of this noise. And um, I get so many people from the red pill space who are very young males mm -hmm. asking to come on my show to give advice and content on women and relationships. And I'm always polite in my declining of that. But to me, that's wildly ironic. Like if I want relationship advice, I'm going to go to someone who's 60, <laughs> you know, who's got a lot of experience, not someone who's not even got pubes yet. They're, they're so young, but, you know, they're this massive creator. And, you know, that fresh and fit, for example, the shit that I mean, look, some of the stuff he said was quite interesting, but he spouted a lot of shit. And, and, and the guy's not old enough to really understand, like the only people that can really understand women are women and men are trying to understand mm. women and it's very difficult. And so I think there's this massive noise about relationships from people who haven't got a clue, who are too young and too inexperienced. Um, and I think that's a real, I think that's part of the problem 
in the world. Shouting about what women want and what women need and what women like, even though they've got no clue about it. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think there's currently a gold mine online uh, to currently be mined when it comes to basically on the other gender, regardless of whether or not you're a man or a woman. Um, and I think that has to do with uh, a growing, an ever growing schism of uh, just trying to figure out what our boundaries are as human beings in what is becoming a boundaryless world. I think one of the things about, uh, you know, the, the current wave of like liberal policies and you know, there's basically like the, the fluidity of uh, gender, identity, sexuality, any of it is that, you know, while I'm never going to come across and basically say like, oh, like gay marriage should be like abolished or whatever, like these liberal policies have sort of brought along a bit of a side effect of boundarylessness where there's there's no right for anyone to critique anyone because of this hyper individualistic uh notion that we've all kind of gotten in our heads in the West, which makes sense that this is essentially where everything ended up leading, because we are an individualistic society. But as a result of sort of individualism having run awry, all of a sudden, we are not willing to participate in any sort of um, community based uh, or, or category based uh, categorization. And as, as a result, like, there's, there's not really a way for anyone to have any boundaries around uh, how they view the world. And I think as a result of that sort of lack of boundaries out in the world, people are starting to internalize that and they're starting to like really need to uh, struggle with what it is to be a man and what it is to be a woman. I think content creators have realized that if they can come on and basically take, you know, uh, age old marketing advice where you basically like throw rocks in an enemy because that's something that just like hacks a part of our brain that causes us to be like excited and to build a community around, et cetera, et cetera. They kind of hack that part of our brains and grow the schism even more uh, in a realm, like you said, that ultimately they don't have a lot of experience in. I mean, you know, I've, I've been in essentially a decade's worth of relationships and I still don't have a lot of experience to a certain degree. I'm only 31. But if I was looking for relationship advice, I would be going to something like the Gottman Institute rather than Fresh and Fit uh, to, to really kind of figure out like what, 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 what are the elements of a successful long-term relationship? Because these guys in red pill space many times are like their longest relationship is less than a year, but they're getting online and talking about the nature of women. And, you know, I could, I could take that same critique and talk about plenty of elements of the of the feminist movement as well. But again, I think everyone has kind of figured out that there's a gold mine to be to be mined and everyone's selling the picks to try and get in on the on the gravy train. Mm. So on that paradoxical thought, how do you spot a fake guru? <laughs> this this one's hard, man. I mean, uh, I th this is maybe too basic of an answer because I I'm generally pretty good at following my inner compass to kind of know when someone's full of shit and when they're not. And even if I happen to be wrong about it, which I'm not wrong a lot of the time, um, at the end of the day, it's not the end of the world. It's just, I, I can get my information elsewhere. Right. But I think the easiest way to tell if someone is full of shit out in the world is to confront yourself with, you know, what Jordan Peterson talks about, for example, which is just basically putting yourself in a position where you tell the truth 100% of the time to yourself and to the people around you, because by doing that, you actually get a very deep insight into your motivations around lying in the first place. You get a lot of insight into how you used to lie. And as a result of kind of gaining a deeper awareness of that, rather than having it just sort of work in the subconscious because you're out lying and you're not really noticing that you're lying. Uh, if, if you can sort of bring yourself back and really center your life around telling the truth, you start to be able to pick up on these cues from the people around you. Uh, in terms of whether or not they're full of shit. And I, you know, maybe this is me tooting my own horn too much and maybe I'm kind of wrong about this, but I've even found within the, like the last two years or whatever, every time I've gone against my instinct when it comes to someone that I meet for the first time about whether or not I feel like they're full of shit. Like, let's say I feel like they're full of shit the first time I meet them. Every time I give them the benefit of the benefit of the doubt about like six months to a year later, I always kick myself in the ass and think to myself, God, I should have gone with my first impression of that person. And the only reason I think I'm able to do that, and again, maybe I'm delusional, who knows, maybe I'm, I'm just uh, 
looking too deeply into my own instinct or whatever. But um, I think the only way that I've been able to develop that for myself is just to tell the truth to the people around me. And as a result, I can kind of pick up with, uh, with, with other people when they're telling me something that isn't true. So there's some, a fascinating point I'd like to just chuck in here because hmm. um, a lot of people in the business space you know, might say, you know, when you're making business decisions and doing deals and hiring staff and whatever else, you should trust your instinct. Mm. I don't agree with that. And here's why. Mm. I think when it comes to humans and human nature, we have inbuilt instinct. I do believe that we are humans. We interact in relationships. We have instinct built in. But we don't have instincts for business and deals and negotiation and buying real estate built in. We have to learn that. Mm -hmm. So would you agree or disagree that whilst instinct for people, you should trust yourself, but instinct and intuition in business, you shouldn't trust that if you've never done it before. And you should go to someone who's done it for 20 years because actually instinct and intuition is experience. What do you think about that? Yeah. So. As you were kind of saying that, I, I the the first thing that came to mind was uh, my experience as a violinist. I actually uh, was a professional violinist prior to being a content creator. I've been playing for 27 years, and you know, if if anyone were to come to me and say, "Oh, you know, dude, I really want to play the violin, but I, I think I'm gonna do it by intuition rather than hiring a teacher," I would probably be like, "Yo, bro, that's like the worst idea that you could possibly come up with." So I I would definitely. Uh, encourage them to go in a different direction than following their gut or following their intuition when it comes to something skilled like like business. So I, I would definitely agree with the point that you made. And did you change your career as a violinist to become a content creator or are you doing both? I changed it. Definitely. Um, I, you know, when I was a violinist, I was practicing anywhere between like four and six hours a day. And now I'm lucky if I get in 30 minutes every like month and a half. So I, I love the violin. Uh, like I said, I've played it for a long time. And if there happens to be like a band at a, at a bar and I happen to have my violin on me, I can still like hop in and, and jam. But, uh, but yeah, in terms of like the, the way that I, you know, make a living at this point and on top of that, uh, just what do I spend my day doing? Uh, violin has definitely taken a, a bit of a backseat for now. And I, I don't think that'll be forever. I think at some point I'd actually love to integrate violin into what it is that I'm doing with anti-profit, but uh, I'm still trying to figure out how that would look even for myself. Right, I want to explore this a bit because the originally my show, which started nearly nine years ago, hmm. um, was called The Disruptive Entrepreneur. It's now called Disruptors. But really it was to help people start and scale their own business, you know, move from employed to self-employed, to turn their passion into profession, uh, do what they love and love what they do. And like, I don't know what your parents think, but many might say that you are on crack cocaine to walk away from something that you're clearly amazingly good at and that you clearly could create an amazing career in 27 years, four to six hours a day. But you've put that down to go and make YouTube videos. I mean, this surely sh shows how different the world is. Um, what would you say to that, to parents of you or other people who might think people are mad to take that risk? Um, and how maybe the world has changed in how we make our living now? Sure. Well, I think the unfortunate thing with something like classical music, for example, is uh, it requires an attention span that is at minimum something like, you know, for, for the general piece of music, like let's say 16 minutes. And that's like at the low end. Uh, I mean, you can get into classical music and be dealing with like symphonies that go into 90 to 100 minutes uh, where you're expected to kind of sit in silence and listen to something for that period of time. Um, so I think, you know, me, me making the switch uh, from, from violin into content creation was, was almost a necessity just because when it comes to classical music, it's, it's a dying art and it's too bad that that is the case. But uh, we, uh, in, in most cases, people don't have the attention span for it. And it's kind of like learning a, a, a foreign language. It's a, it's a language that we all kind of understand, but peripherally. Um, and as a result, you know, coming in and being like, hey, I play the violin. Do you want to listen to a 45 minute uh, symphony by Robert Schumann? 
most people are going to be like, nah, man, I'm good. Whereas, you know, we live in the digital age where, you know, YouTube videos at this point um, are are considered too long for a vast majority of like younger people who, uh, you know, consume content. Uh, I mean, if, if they can't do it with like, uh, you know, some sort of like travel vlog and they can't make it through those 15 minutes, uh, expecting them to sit through 15 minutes of a of a Brahms quartet uh, is, is probably not going to happen either. But um, I, I think in terms of my parents, let's say, I, I actually had a, a pretty organic move into content creation in general, just because I, I sort of had to stop doing violin out of necessity as a result. Um, you know, there were no uh, gigs during that period of time. Uh, there were no students even because people weren't going to people's houses. I wasn't interested in teaching lessons via Zoom that, that just wasn't interesting to me at the time. So I just kind of started moving into digital marketing because I had some time and I wanted to try out a new skill. And on top of that, I didn't have to do any of the heavy lifting. Well, actually, that's not even true. I was about to say I didn't have to do any of the heavy lifting, talking people into letting me do YouTube videos and throwing away, away my career. Because again, I sort of went from being a violinist into managing a 15 person team for a major content creator, which was a, a bit of a leap in its own right. But um even before, like be between violin and that uh, thing as a content creator, I, I actually uh, did did something pretty cringe. And I I started trying to become a content creator as a bit of a dating coach. Uh, I, I created a, a course that I was selling for like $50 or something that taught men how to optimize their Tinder profiles to get more matches. And it was a complete disaster. I think I spent around $12,000 developing the brand and the product or whatever. And I think I made $97. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think... At that point in time, my family was definitely thinking to themselves, oh, my God, this is a disaster. What is this kid doing? Um, but then luckily, the the actual position came along. And then between that position into what it is that I'm doing with anti-profit, it, it, it was a very organic uh, uh, change uh, from, from brand to brand. So you mentioned you'd quite be keen to um, integrate your violin into your content. So I'm the kind of guy... I have a million ideas. Um, hmm. Many entrepreneurs who are good but also chaotic also have a million ideas. And I'm not the kind of guy that keeps them inside. I share all my ideas. Because if I can't make money out of it, I want you to make money out of it. Because if we all make money, we're all going to be better off. Hmm. So I had this idea. I'm going to throw it out to you and the world. I want to do it, but I might not. And if someone beats me, then good on them. Because cool. I'm always looking for guests. And, you know, the super famous people, there's not many, a huge amount of them and they're busy. But I had this idea where I could go and interview people, but instead of them answering the question, speaking, they would be a talented musician, like a rock guitarist, classical pianist, classical violinist. And I would ask them a series of questions, but instead of answering in their words, they would play some music to express the answer through their instrument is that a really stupid idea because i have a lot of them or could there be something in that well look i think that content would do extraordinarily well with musicians i think uh especially the the more autistic ones of us uh, generally think that that's the only way that we can actually express ourselves in the first place just because you words are things that we're generally not good at um but yeah, I think if you were to ask some sort of question and then have the like a jazz pianist or something or a jazz guitarist or, or even as you said, a rock rock guitarist come in and sort of respond via just like a solo that they come up with um, on the spot. I mean, yeah, I actually do think that would do really, really well with uh, with musicians. I think they'd eat that up like uh, like hotcakes. Right. Harry. <laughs> take um, note. We need take to, note. <laughs> yeah, we need to reach out to some musicians. We know a few. OK. Right. Um, what we love to do in our show is we love to do some quick fire questions and we love to do them because people's attention span is shorter, um, because they can be used for all the channels, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to just change it up a little bit and ask you a few questions, which maybe you just want to answer it 15, 30 seconds, a minute, whatever, but maybe just a little bit quicker. Sure. Is YouTube censoring you? Yes. And the reason why is because the videos that they're choosing to demonetize uh, make absolutely no sense. It just happens to be because I'm talking about uh, 
something that's considered to be like a political hot button issue, uh, even if what it, what it is that I'm saying is not uh, polarizing in the slightest. Uh, it, it's it's censoring. I, though that being said, I think that they have the right to do it. They're they're a private platform. They need to make money, and if that's the way that they can attract advertisers, then more power to them. Why should we stop watching your videos? Oh, just to go out and touch some grass. I think most people need to get off the internet in general. I think we are all terminally online to a certain degree. Um, and uh, just disconnecting and going out and actually living in our real lives uh, brings a lot of value that nothing on your phone screen ever will. How do you stop woke culture? You start telling the truth. I think uh, you start telling the truth and you start developing healthy boundaries between yourselves and others. Uh, if you're able to basically have a really clear internal line for yourself where you can understand if a problem is someone else's or if it's your own uh, and then take responsibility for the things that you can but not hold other people to responsibility for things out of their control, uh, then most of woke culture dries up as a result. Why should we judge people harshly? I think, in my experience, judging people harshly has more to do with kind of going with your gut instinct, uh, with your first impression of a person. I think as long as you have your life set up appropriately, where again, you're telling the truth uh, to yourself and the people around you, you have a pretty good radar for bullshit. And every time you go against that radar in order to give someone the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I, I would say more times than not, uh, you're going to get kicked in the ass. And um, even if you don't get kicked in the ass, it's not the end of the world. If one person ends up uh, going the other way and you go your way, uh, just because there are plenty of opportunities in the world to tap into. Do we live in the matrix? I think the matrix is more of an internal thing than it is uh, some sort of oppressive world government. Uh, I think, for example, in my Instagram bio, I say escaped the matrix. To me, what that means is I escaped the uh, internal programming that I was holding on to that, uh, you know, defeated me in terms of self-esteem, uh, gave me a negative view of myself in the world. And by being able to surmount that, I was able to go out into the world and actually create the life that I wanted for myself. Would you rather have one million pounds or dollars or whatever currency in cash or one million engaged followers of your content and why? Engaged uh, followers of my content because uh, the, the great thing about a personal brand, for example, is if you bring something that has legitimate value to market, it can be in any industry and it can be in vastly different industries and your audience as long as they trust you and as long as you give them a reason to trust you by not bullshitting them, uh, those million people will give you a dollar at least over and over and over and over again. Um, and that, that isn't manipulation on your end. Your job is to create legitimate value and to help people. And if you can do that, uh, you can do that 50 to 100 times uh, and you know turn those million followers into 50 to 100 million dollars as a result. Can money buy happiness? No, but it allows you to experience the happiness that you might have internally at a much higher level. <laughs> money can't buy happiness, but it can buy Patek Philippe. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> right, now I want to come back out of the quick fire round. Thanks for doing that. And just maybe get to know you a, a little bit more. Sure. Um, I understand you left America. Is that true? And why? And where are you now, if you don't mind me sharing? And why is it better? Sure. So that is correct. I left America and I currently live in Bali. I've been living here for the last year and a half. And the reason I did it originally uh, was to take up this position uh, of working with a content creator. However, I think... On a more foundational level, um, I had developed a lifestyle for myself in America and specifically Utah, which is where I'm from, that uh, was just not conducive. I was essentially an alcoholic. I was going out and not even essentially I was an alcoholic. Uh, I was going out seven nights a week, 
eight or nine cocktails every single night. Um, the crowd that I was running with were people that, um, I wouldn't say that they didn't have my best interests at heart, but, um, it, it was a crew, it was a crew of people that were hurting a lot internally. And that's not something I hold against them, but there's a reason we hung out every night, uh, and, and went to bars. Um, on top of that, I was in a place where I had this mindset that, uh, you know, the best version of me was, uh, to, be able to sleep with a lot of women in what I was calling an ethical way, uh, just by, you know, being honest with people, not pulling anyone's leg or anything like that and being upfront. Uh, and you know, I think subconsciously my, my mind was trying to save myself, uh, save my mind was trying to save me from myself, uh, by taking me to a different place. That's more sort of Island life. People here are more relaxed. Uh, there are a lot of really inspiring, creative people here. There are also a lot of partiers and, you know, I brought my alcoholism with me to Bali for the first, uh, probably nine months of me being here, but the, the change of pace was absolutely necessary because I, I was kind of the worst type of drunk. Uh, I was not spending money that I didn't have. I wasn't pissing people off and I wasn't doing anything physically dangerous. And the reason why I say that's the worst kind of drunk is because you're essentially functional. There's no real repercussion in your day-to-day -day life. But as a result, you're like destroying your body in a very real way that will end up catching up with you. And um, I, again, I think my mind was pushing me in the direction to come out here because it's kind of, it, it, it knew this is where I needed to be in order to kind of get my life together and uh, start actually living out the, the morals that I was espousing. Um, to, to myself. So I think that's, that's sort of why I ended up out here. We're in a world right now where um, alcohol is obviously pervasive. And if you look at Andrew Tate, he's quit alcohol, perhaps for religious purposes. If you look at his brother, he is renowned for being a big drinker. Mm -hmm. um, I used to drink a lot at university. It's obviously a cultural thing here. Um, and I quit the day I started my company and yeah. I've probably drunk a dozen drinks in the last 17 years, including my wedding night. <laughs> so can people function in business? Can people function successfully and drink regularly? Or do you have a strong opinion that you need to quit, go completely dry in order to be successful and healthy? Uh, yeah, I don't believe that at all. I think plenty of people are able to moderate uh, their intake of alcohol in a way where it's just, you know, something fun that they do that doesn't affect them negatively. I do, however, think that everyone has that vice, what, whether it's alcohol, whether it's gambling, whether it's being codependent on the people around you, whether it's, um, you know, anything that like uh, Dr. Gabor Mate talks about. He has a very wide definition of, uh, of the word addiction. And it's basically just using some sort of external stimuli to quell internal pain because you don't have the skills to actually uh, take care of that, uh, take care of that yourself. I think everyone has that, uh, that vice that they use to deal with that thing. And I think ultimately it's within everyone's kind of hero's journey, if you will, to figure out how to um, overcome it, or at the very least, integrate it into their life in a way that's manageable. I think the thing with me is just alcohol. Alcohol happened to be my vice, and the the realization that I came to is just that there was there was there was no I don't know there there was no real way for me to regulate it, and you know it was actually a really difficult thing for me to do as like an adult male to basically say, hey, this is something that I don't have control over and to sort of sacrifice that control over to, I don't know, the, the universe and basically call myself um, powerless in that regard. Um, but by doing that, um, I was able to kind of make the choice uh, when I was actually starting anti-profit, actually, to be like, hey, you know what, like, I enjoy doing this more and I have a harder time doing it when I'm hung over. So maybe I'll just stop doing it. Um, and yeah, that's, that's sort of why I did it. So I no, I don't think everyone needs to stop drinking. I don't have a particularly hard, hardcore stance against alcohol. You know, I've been dating people who, who drink and party pretty hard and it doesn't bother me. It's just something, it's, it's my vice that I need to deal with. And, uh, you know, whatever other people's vices are, it's, uh, it's, it's their business. I, I won't ever make a comment on it unless they ask me for advice. Sure. So I'm asking you, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I've got a different opinion on that and I, 
if you don't mind, I'm just going to quickly share it because um, alcohol is a poison. Now, I know anything can be a poison if consumed too much and possibly anything could be the opposite of a poison if consumed in, in the right dose. But, um, you know, a lot of people in the, the health space, scientific research suggests that alcohol is a poison. Um, so from a place of non-judgment, if you want to be successful in business, I would say quit alcohol. Or you know, the doctors even ask you, how many units do you drink a week? Mm -hmm. And generally it's recognised that maybe a couple of units a week is maximum. So basically anyone who wants to take a questionnaire on your health one of the things they're going to ask that might affect your health is how much alcohol do you, do you drink? It, you know, mm -hmm. I guess much like sugar now, which is seen as a poison. Um, and coming back to something you said earlier, because this fascinated me, I asked you in quick fire round one um, why you should judge people harshly, but you also come across like you don't want to judge people. So mm. I find that a bit of a paradox that you're saying we should judge people harshly. But aren't we all just struggling to do our best in life and get ahead? And if we judge people too harshly, maybe are we prejudging their humanity? And, and should we maybe, would, would humanity be better if we judged a bit less harshly? What do you think? Sure. Yeah, that's, that's definitely fair. And I, I realized uh, on the second question that the uh, speed fire round was coming from titles of my videos. So uh, <laughs> I, I maybe would have answered it a little bit differently had I known that going into it. Um, so the, the title to that is, is very clickbaity and that's essentially how I, I sort of utilize, um, my titles in a lot of my videos. My title is like very polarizing, very clickbaity, but that gets you to click on it so that you end up getting a, a more rounded out message. I think in terms of when I meet people in my everyday life, uh, if I don't click with someone or if I feel like someone's like full of shit, I actually make it more like my issue to deal with than it, than I make it theirs. You know, I'm not I'm not out here being a dick to anyone uh, to to basically like prove some sort of like moral point on on strangers that I meet um, at a at a group gathering. I think more than anything, um, it's just me sort of thinking to myself, okay, I have a limited bandwidth, I have a limited amount of space. Uh, you know, I'll I'll commit that to people that I feel like I can put a little bit more trust in, put a little bit more, um, uh, uh, more investment into. Um, and then the other people that's just kind of come across as sort of meh or, um, or as full of shit. Uh, I just kind of go my separate way, but I don't use a lot of emotional bandwidth, like being angry about that particular person or treating them like they're, they're a piece of shit, certainly. Hmm. So you actually just raised a really fascinating point. Um, mm. And yeah, a lot of those quick fire questions were the titles of your videos because we like to do our research here. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, the paradox of social media and clickbait. So I, I, I'm going to label you something. I hope you don't mind my projection. With kindness, mm -hmm. I believe you are an artist. You played the violin for 27 years. I believe that is an art form. Um, I also believe if you want to be a successful content creator, you also have to be a bit of an analyst, i.e. look at the retention, thumbnails, click through, etc. And so we have the creative and the, the capital, if you like, or the analytical as one paradox that's wrestling us. And then we have our art as content versus our art being seen. And I make a point having this conversation regularly with people on the show because it's a great discussion to have, which is basically art versus marketing. So it sounds like you want to treat humans well and you want to share a message that's useful to humanity. That's the impression I'm getting. But it also sounds like you're aware that if you don't put a clickbaity title, no one's going to find you listen to you sure. and so therefore because nothing exists in a vacuum you don't exist so do you want to talk about if you have that paradox if you struggle with it how far are you prepared to go in the titles and the thumbnail and the clickbait to draw the person in the further you go the more 
uh, of, because um, a clickbait is essentially, I'll show you X, but you'll get Y. I think it originated in pornography, in fact. Um, because wouldn't it all just be nice if we could all just share our message with the world and do our art, and of course the millions would find us and it would all be okay. Sorry, it's a long-winded question, but do you, do you know what I'm talking about and have you got an answer? Yeah, sure. So I think ultimately um, when it comes to clickbaity titles, I think if you can kind of uh, give someone a title that is hyper-polarizing, but then give them a message that kind of brings them back to the middle and gives them a little bit of sanity, in my mind, that clickbait is actually much more useful than, you know, something that we were seeing in like 2009 where it says like, granny sleeps with like 48 guys you won't believe. And then it, you click on the thing and it's like a recipe for like kale, uh, for like some sort of kale recipe. Um, I, I think those two types of clickbait are, are very separate things. But to sort of uh, address your question in terms of artistry, I, I think something that artists deal with a lot more than they should or they wrestle with a lot more than they should um is the word should um i think you know audiences should do a lot of things but if an audience or uh you know a crowd of people aren't behaving the way that you want them to behave with the message that you're presenting the problem isn't the people the problem is the way that you're presenting it and you know i'm not even saying that on like moral grounds it's just like whose responsibility is it for someone to be receptive to your message or your art it's certainly not their fucking responsibility they have uh lives they have limited bandwidth themselves so your job as a creator as an artist as uh, even as a person who's dedicated to the analytics on something like youtube is to figure out how to cut through the noise and to provide value to people by maybe giving them a clickbaity title that plays to their pre-established beliefs in my case, but then takes them on a journey to something that's a little bit less polarizing, a little bit more grounded in reality. Um, so, you know, I, I think, yeah, uh, when it, when it comes to artists complaining about whether or not their art is understood, because it's usually an indication that nobody cares about their art. Um, the only person that's going to fix that problem is the artist. It's certainly not the crowd or society bending to the will of the artist by any means. Right. So, um, are we okay to f finish on quick fire round two? Sure. Yeah, let's do it. I'll, I, hopefully, I'm, I'm more prepared this time. Let's let's go for it. Preparation is so overrated. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Can America stop the war? I think it could if it stopped funding Ukraine. Absolutely. I think it would uh, dry up within a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, I, I think ultimately uh, the war in Ukraine is a proxy war between uh, the US and Russia. And whether or not it has its merits, I think you could make cases for both sides, including uh, the Russian side, which has to do with this fight against uh, hyper-liberalism in, in the West. Uh, regardless of, of the merits of either side, um, if the funding stops, the war stops. And that would probably mean that Ukraine would have to cede territory over to Russia. But uh, it, it doesn't change the fact that the war would stop if the funding stopped as a result. So why don't they stop the funding? Because, I mean, look, all right, here we go. It's conspiracy theory time. Look, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm no expert on geopolitics. So I'm just some guy talking shit into a camera, as I, as I like to say. Um, I think this has to do with something uh, related to like the military industrial complex. I think there's a lot of money on the line when it comes to uh, sending weapons over to foreign countries um, because there's a lot of money to be made. And um, I think the moment that the military industrial complex comes to a screeching halt, um, our economy goes into a serious tailspin. And I think, um, you know, people want to avoid doing that, but they also want to continue making money. Now, is that me just hypothesizing something out of my ass to a certain degree? Yes, but uh, I, I think it's a pretty compelling hypothesis. I've never heard the phrase hypothesizing out of my ass, but I quite like it. Yeah, it's a good one. I, I just came up with it on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think Christianity has become a joke? Because Christianity has started to embrace the very ideals that it has fought vehemently against over the last 2,000 years. And I think that as a result of that, 
a lot of Christians and a lot of non-Christians are looking at Christianity and sort of laughing at it because like Christianity doesn't have any sort of spine to sit on top of anymore because it won't actually like stand up for the things that uh, it, it espouses in the modern world. Now, uh, I should also say that I'm not religious. I'm, I'm not a Christian uh, and I'm not is Islamic either. But I think a big reason why something like Islam is becoming more and more um, uh, popular in the modern day is because at least they practice what it is that they say they preach instead of trying to be inclusive to everyone. Do I think uh, being like excluding people is necessarily like the right way to go about things, especially if you're burning witches at the stake? No. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, people value consistency in an age of just complete pandemonium. And if you can't keep that consistency within your religion and instead are basically trying to bow to the demands of outside social pressures in order to keep your tithing coming in because your church is going bankrupt, uh, then yeah, I, I think people have a right to call your religion a joke. Wow. Final question. Great. Do you think a central bank digital currency is coming? And if you do, is this good for humanity? Yes, it's coming. And I'm very afraid. <laughs> um, I, I mean, look, man, it's, uh, it, you know, we, we see kind of what's going on over in uh, uh, communist China at the moment. Uh, it's just people are being uh, actually separated from certain elements of society based on the social views that they hold. Um, if they happen to jaywalk uh, and a camera catches them, which at this point, cameras can not only identify people by their faces, but by their walking patterns. Um, and as a result of that, you know, pictures are essentially being sent to that person, to the person's community in order to shame them and their social credit score goes down and it changes the way that they're actually able to spend their money. Um, I, I think all of this stuff is coming down the pipeline. And I think, you know, within the next 10 years, the world as we know it is going to be a completely different thing. One that is akin to more, in my opinion, at least in the West, is going to be more akin to something like Brave New World, where we're basically uh, coddled into comfort in order to extract the highest amount of profit from us. And I think if you can uh, disincentivize people breaking out of that coddling of the American mind uh, by basically threatening to uh, shun them from society by restricting their currency because it's all controlled uh, digitally in a, in a centralized location, uh, it, that's, that's, that's a scary future. And I, I, I do think it's coming. Um, yeah, I, that's what I have to say. <laughs> So this show is called Disruptors. What does the word disruptive mean to you? That's a good question. I was actually thinking about that uh, when you first, uh, uh, when you guys first invited me to the show. A disruptor to me uh, seems to be someone who uh, kind of goes with like a, an ongoing trend of some sort, but instead of just going in the direction of everyone else, they take the momentum of that trend and then take it in a, in a wildly different direction. I think that's the first thing that would uh, uh, that would come to mind there. Whether or not that necessarily applies to me, I'm not entirely sure. But uh, I think visually, that's almost the the idea that came to mind when I first was exposed to your brand, and I was like, "Oh, okay, disruptors. What does that mean?" Uh, that that was kind of the. It's it's almost like a wave in the ocean uh, being disrupted by another wave in the opposite direction, but with the same amount of momentum. If that makes sense. And where can we follow you? Where are you most active on social media? Sure. So you can follow me on YouTube, Instagram, as well as TikTok at anti.profit. That is profit like the religious leader, uh, not like the capitalistic model, though I'm not your prophet. Uh, or on Twitter at anti underscore profit. I'm pretty sure that's my Twitter handle. I'm not entirely sure. I'll have to look at that one. But you'll 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 see my stuff over there. Um, I just barely started posting there a, a few weeks ago, so it's it's pretty new. But uh, yeah, those are those are the four places you can find me. So it's it's a first for me in nearly a thousand episodes to interview someone and not know how to thank them by what name because they're wearing a mask and therefore <laughs> they are anonymous. So I'm going to call you Dave. Right. <laughs> Uh, and Dave, I want to say thanks a lot for being on the show. It's been a pleasure. I hope you've enjoyed it and um, keep up the good work. Thanks so much, Rob. I really appreciate the invite. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you.
If you'd like to show your support, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn the notification bell on.